works, yes. Okay, good, thank you. So thank you and uh, it's really a honor and a joy to speak to you once more. And uh, since I don't want you to be bored, I change my topic each time. And this time I will speak about Erwin Schrödinger, a physicist, a creator of quantum mechanics, who had also a theory of mind and of matter that was very much inspired from, from some uh, Indian philosophies. It was a mixture of Indian philosophies, some Advaita Vedanta, some drops of Buddhism also. So, exactly. So, Erwin Schrödinger was well known as a pioneer of quantum mechanics. He is, you, you don't have it? Yes. Yes, sorry. That's a pity. <laughs> That's, does it work? Does it work? Doesn't work. Okay, so without PowerPoint, but I, I'll help, I will help myself. So, in fact, Schrodinger was well known as a creator of quantum mechanics, so he was the author of two things. The author of the Schrodinger equation, that is a pillar of quantum mechanics, and also he was the author of this, the famous cat paradox, that is well known as an important paradox of quantum mechanics. So, second slide. Um, Schrodinger's life was very interesting. He was born in Austria and he died in Austria, but after a long trip in England and uh, in Ireland because he was uh, escaping Nazism. But uh, the most important thing I want to say about his biography is that uh, he was interested in Indian philosophy since his teenage. And, um, and uh, he read a lot of, um, of Indian philosophy while he was at the university. Then after the, uh, after the First World War, he started again to read Indian philosophy because he wanted to become a philosopher. He didn't want to be a physicist. And uh, at the end of his life, he wrote a, a very beautiful book called Mind and Matter in which he exposes his philosophy, which is very much inspired by Indian philosophy. Uh, he read a lot of philosophy from India, as I, I told you. He, in fact, he had all the literature that was translated in German and English at that time, namely at the beginning of the 20th century. He read especially Dusen's outline of the, of the Vedanta and also a lot of books about Buddhism, especially the book of Lafcadio Hearn about uh, Zen Buddhism. Um, in his, on his grave, you find a, a table just at the bottom of the, the grave, which is located in Alpbach in Austria, in the Alps. And you see already a mark of this wonderful Indian-like philosophy. A philosophy that was monistic, I think. He says, all being is an, a one and only being, and that it continues to be when someone dies, tells you that this one did not cease to be. Schrodinger was very critical about metaphysical views, yet he held a metaphysical view of his own. So we have to explain that. First of all, he was keen on Kant's critique of metaphysics in his critique of pure reason. You know that in this book, Kant had dilemmas of reason, namely, there are two theses, two views, that are just as plausible rationally one than another. And therefore, since they are both as plausible as one another, that means that in fact reason contradicts itself when it, uh, sh it sees views. Uh, even more powerfully, you find Nagarjuna's Tetralemma, in which uh, you are dissolved the views about the inherent nature of things. 
Yet, in spite of this critical attitude, uh, Schrodinger had a metaphysics, as, as I told you. Um, he insisted, first of all, that the critical attitude towards metaphysical speculation has nowhere found a more marked expression than in Buddhist wisdom. Here he was thinking of Nagarjuna's uh, critique of views. Yet he used metaphysical views as a, a guidance and also, you know, as a way for one view to be uh, an antidote against another less advanced view. So that's the reason why he held a view, a non-dualist view of matter, mind and matter that was borrowed essentially from Advaita Vedanta. According to, to Schrodinger, there were three basic illusions. The illusion of the duality of mind and matter, the illusion of the multiplicity of minds and consciousnesses, and the illusion of material bodies. Just to say about something about the multiplicity of mind and consciousness, according to uh, Schrodinger, the idea of the multiplicity of minds and consciousness is a construct, is a concept. Our basic experience is, on the, is that there is only one consciousness. We experience only one consciousness that we wrongly call my consciousness. But there is only one. Also, he was very averse about the idea that there are multiple minds, multiple bodies also, sorry. He said, myriads of suns surrounded by possibly inhabited planets, multiplicity of galaxies, each one of its myriads of suns. According to me, all this is Maya, even if a very lawful and interesting Maya. So you see, he was a physicist. He studied galaxies, uh, planets, and laws of nature, but he found that all these things were essentially illusion, Maya. But, as he said, because he was a physicist, interesting Maya. The illusion of many minds, as I told you, he had a, a very special feeling about that and a very special experience. He said, think of this man, such as this one. You, say, you, you see this man uh, standing on the right of the picture. Think of this man who was standing here one century ago. Was he another person? Wasn't he identical to you? But after all, what is your I? So he was critical about personal identity, about the substantiality of the ego. It is by thinking, especially the individual ego, it is by thinking this way that one suddenly experiences the truth of Advaita Vedanta. The life that you are living presently is not only a fragment of existence, it is in a certain sense the whole. Yet, yet in spite of this Advaitin way of thinking, he had also a very strong a criticism of the substantiality of the I. Similar to uh, David Hume, to Ernst Mach, and to Buddhism. According to him, individual ego is only a complex of thoughts and sensations, temporarily associated. Schrodinger has also a Buddhist conception, or Buddhist-like conception of reincarnation. He says this, it is certain that, that the earth will give birth to you again and again for new struggles and new sufferings. And not only in the future, it resuscitates you now, today, every day. Not just once, but several thousand times, exactly as it buries you every day, several thousand times. So the idea is that our personal identity is not a substance. It is a process with causes and effects. Each state of mind causes a following state of mind. And therefore, you disappear and resuscitate every, at every moment. I think this is a very similar view with respect to, to Buddhism. And here we see a, a view that is expressed in King Melinda's uh, dialogue. He who is reborn, Nagasena, is the same, is is the same person or another, neither the same nor another. That means that reincarnation doesn't mean, you know, um, 
passing one soul to, from one body to another, but it's passing a process, a causal process. And therefore, the following state is neither the same nor the, the, another with respect to the previous state. But how does the illusion of many minds arise? First of all, Schrodinger gave a comparison. When a dreamer has dreams of several characters, the dreamer is one, and yet the characters are many. So in the same way, we have the illusion of many minds, but, but there is only one, according to Schrodinger. Now, the mechanism, how it comes that we believe in the multiplicity of mind? The reason why we believe in the multiplicity of mind is that we project minds on objects. And in order to frame, to, to build our concept of objects, we need first to extract from our experience everything subjective and keep only structures, conceptual structures or mathematical structures that can be shared between all of us. In this way, we get an objective knowledge. But then, when we do that, we ascribe conscious experience to ob objectified bodies that we believe are out there. Um, this view, ha this very common view in science and in scientific materialism, has very negative consequences for Western science and ethics. The first negative consequence is that we have what is called the hard problem. The hard problem of the material origin of consciousness. Why is it so? Because we first extract ourselves from our experience in order to keep only the structures, then the scientific structures, then we try to recover consciousness, to deduce consciousness from these objectified structures. But it's absurd because objectified structures has precisely been elaborated by extracting our subjectivity from it. So recovering subjectivity from objectivity is a contradiction in terms. First problem. Second problem, it's ethics. You know, the materialist view of the world is inherently non-ethical. And uh, Schrodinger has a wonderful way of putting things. Dear reader, recall the bright, joyful eyes with which your child beams upon you when you bring him a new toy. And then let the physicist tell you that in reality nothing emerges from these eyes. In reality, their only objectively detectable function is continually to be hit by and to receive light quanta. In reality, a strange reality, something seems to be missing in it. When you see a child objectively, you lose the flavor of the contact, of the love. So the materialist outlook is poor ethically. Then, illusion of many bodies. First of all, you know, what is a body? According to a philosopher of mind such as Schrodinger, a body is just that. It is, you know, the focus of many perceptions. One, your present perception, the perceptions that you believe others have of the same object, and the person, perceptions you will have in the future if you go around and see it from different sides. So, in fact, an object is a complex, is not an inherently existing thing. Now, this usually, in everyday life, these complexes are very stable, and therefore you believe that they are substantial. But do the atoms and electrons, so the micro-object, do, do they really exist in the same sense as tables and chairs? And Schrodinger answers, no, they, don't, they are not similar to chairs and table. Why? Because they are unstable. They cannot be followed dot after dot, point after point, uh, continuously in space and time. And therefore, they have a different mode of existence. What is a particle which has no trajectory or no path, asked Schrodinger? The particles, in the naive sense of the old days, do not exist. And he could have said they do not exist inherently. Um, 
Now, what is the relation between this philosophy of mind and matter, borrowed essentially from Advaita Vedanta, and uh, Schrodinger's uh, views of physics? Not so many, in fact, but there are two types of relations. First relation, it's complementarity. Second relation, it's inspiration. Yes, um, philosophy complements science because science is incomplete. As you, uh, as you uh, have seen before, science misses the view of the subjective. Therefore, in philosophy, you can open up the attention towards subjectivity also. Second point, philosophy was an inspiration for Schrodinger's physics. Uh, for instance, in 1925, the very year he created quantum physics, he said particles are nothing but, but a kind of foam crest on the fundamental radiation wave. The idea that beings, you know, visible beings, are just foam on an ocean evokes a metaphor of the Upanishad. Uh, secondly, Schrodinger had a non-dualist view of his own cat paradox. And now I will explain you the cat paradox. The cat paradox is illustrated in this picture. There is a complex uh, device, and then the poor cat is, um, you know, is doomed to, to die if there is a flask of poison that is uh, broken in the box. But the paradox is that it is said that quantum mechanics describes the cat after the experiment in a supposed state both alive and dead. But the cat is found, when you open the door of the lab and you see in it, the cat is found to be either alive or dead. Therefore, there is a paradox. Now, what are the materialist answers? The materialist answers is that cats are inherently real. Therefore, their states are also inherently real. The question they raise is how, do, how can their states spontaneously collapse? And there are many attempts to find a mechanism for the collapse because materialists want mechanisms. Now, there is also a possible dualist answer. The dualist answer is that there are matter material elements described by quantum mechanics, and, but there are also consciousnesses that are different, distinct from that. And in the dualist answer, collapse is imposed when consciousness perceives the cat. Suddenly consciousness, in that view, consciousness collapses the, the state. Schrodinger was critical of both views, both materialist view and dualist view. According to him, when he first formulated the Katz paradox, the Katz experiment prevents us from naively accepting as valid a blurred model of representing reality. According to him, the fact that the cat was represented as blurred, as both alive and dead, was the proof that the, the state function could not be a description of reality. And therefore, he discarded the materialist picture of inherently existing cat and here inherently existing wave, fun wave function or state vectors. Quantum states, in fact, are nothing of this kind. They are not inherent description of an inherent reality. They are just probabilistic anticipations of phenomena that are co-arising with the act of observation. In this way, you immediately dispel the cat paradox because the so-called superposition is no longer an inherent superposition. It's a relative superposition, relative to a future act of, of observation. And here is uh, uh, this outlook of Schrodinger's philosophical views. Thank you very much. Your Holiness, I invite you to comment. From one point of view, 
uh, trying to find out uh, the you know the final answer inference based on the inferences and the part sudo uh just go for this is not explained doctor zena part and the part of objection you see it as a rail, but once you investigate, analyze, then you find it. It's a common thing. Now, all the complexity of understanding the reality, uh, it's, you know, it surfaced only by, by engaging in analytical system of trying to find out, find out trying to find the reality. Quantum physics to Tane, to easy getting a meeting to start a chain to Sane to get some good damper touch to get damper cheek yomans. Saturday in the Sane for touch to the or from the point of view of quantum physics, he says there's no good and evil. Saturday in the Sane, Kanda did share with Jim Zindi. あの、とげめでべて、リシェジョコムドワ。たいね。こう、ガランズルチャタンディトネ。えね。あ、チグヌンジュタムラ、タイチェ。ディトネ、えね。ガランズ。チグチョドリスチェネ。だ。テネグト
So what this suggests is that, um, you know, uh, uh, our inquiry, all of this philosophical inquiry is really driven by a quest for understanding the nature of reality. And as you delve deeper and deeper, what is revealed really points in a quite a different direction from the way in which we will perceive the world. So that's why in Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, after giving a whole list of various factors of existence as well as enlightenment, and then at the end, the, you know, the statement concludes that all of these are mere words, all of these are mere concepts, you know, uh, none of them really exist. Yeah. So there is that paradox thrown in. So, um, and so then the question has to be asked, why are all of these great thinkers and teachers really uh, asking us to get into such deep inquiry? And here, uh, Shantideva, in his eighth chapter at the beginning, um, he says that all of the preceding explanations uh, have been given for the sake of cultivating wisdom. Yes. And those who wish to overcome, so, uh, in the ninth chapter, uh, in the ninth chapter. So he says all the preceding explanations has been presented for the sake of cultivating wisdom. <coughs> and those who wish to seek the elevation of suffering needs to cultivate wisdom. So that really is the point, because the point is a lot of the suffering in our life and in the world are created because we are so fixated on the apparent world that we perceive of our naive you know, view of the world. And based on that, we make categorical, categorical distinctions, we reify, we latch on, we get attached and fixated, which then give rise to a whole host of emotional reactions to our experience and to the world, which then leads to all sorts of behavior. So, uh, and this is beautifully captured in Nagarjuna's uh, Mulamadima Karika, Fundamental uh, Sanskrit on the Middle Way, where he says that, um, you know, karmic actions come from um, uh, uh, falsi falsified forms of thinking, which all of them are rooted in afflictions, which are ultimately rooted in avidya, ignorance. And in, we know f in the Pali tradition, for example, the teaching on the 12 limbs of dependent origination, which explains the process by which we take rebirth, the first member of the chain in that chain is avidya, ignorance. And ignorance gives rise to volition, which then you know, imprints on the consciousness and so on. And to reverse that process, it is only by bringing an end to ignorance that we will be able to give rise to cessation. So all of this really uh, um, underlines the point that the importance of engaging in such critical inquiry is really for the sake of overcoming suffering. Yes. Uh, and that, I think, is an important point uh, that we need to bear in mind. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, I sort of also there, somewhere else sort of also wondering, those quantum physicists uh, who really believe uh, things does not exist objectively. You see, not just intellectually sort of explaining and understanding, but truly believe that. Then these people, uh, I'm wondering whether their sort of contact with sort of uh, our daily life, something good, attractive attachment, some negative anger, So might be less such real sort of today because of full convic conviction, nothing exists objectively. So recently, I heard one article wrote by one Chinese uh, quantum physicist. Uh, he mentioned those people, you see, who believe that, you see, their reaction when they contact with, you see, there's some negative or positive things happen, they are, uh, also the emotional sort of reaction is much neutral. Yes, so, so that, that person, I think, do, do not know uh, whether religious person or not. That's just scientist like that. Mm. So these are the, uh, so they related with, uh, they reduce 
ignorance. Now, ignorance, there are many different levels. Uh, I think obviously, seven billion human beings, everyone wants everyone want happy life. Do not want something. Do not want enemy. So the sources of enemy is your anger. Uh, so now, whether realize or not, the all sort of, sort of negative thing ultimately created from here. That also, you see, very much based on ignorance. Yes. So now, so all those, I think, especially Indian sort of tradition, investigate, now, now for example, where's Atma on this complicated thing? You see, try to reduce wrong view. I feel like that. So according to my own little experience, I have some sort of experience on this uh, wisdom really impact my destructive emotion. Very clear. Yes. Chia uh, Sankar? Thank you. 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 Tenje deva jo ga tenje tongo ni dushe tenje tenje ta gua de tini ume lami nos ti shong de kengshi tenju mai be chongo ye ba mai ba ti shi tongo mai be chongo ye ba mai nos ra teke ada tenju sun sun teke ada ti dom de ti jo do ta de shong de ma da ta yebe ta yebe che de yu jing wen de zhun me bi zhe de pa zhe ni xian yong mao da ni a yong mao de de yin de ume ju gu nang le ya tenem xing de nam jie che be nam du ye ba mai xing. Tell the Shandu Juba, you can Chabuk on a year in Saturday, Chabuk on a year Saturday. Ming Sam said that Chabuk on a year that she go. She was some times at the Teddy. The some time they taught academic work at Mare, Kandanga to Simbuki, Mongot Seatun. So, uh, because of these things, uh, Nagajuna, for example, um, makes an equation between dependent origination and emptiness, says that which is dependent arisen is empty of intrinsic existence. So therefore, there is nothing that is not dependent on the arisen, and there is nothing that is not empty of intrinsic existence. And uh, so, um, so then the question arises, does that mean there is nothing out there? So here, one needs to come up with some understanding of what reality is. And here, Chandrakirti has uh, a really good advice, which is that having objectively <coughs> searched for something to be out there, when at the end of a result you don't find it, then the only existence that we can attribute to them is at the conventional level. It is only by means of convention. Yes, thank you. I think these views, I may say, are very scientific. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, should I? Would you okay. like to have a few moments to yes. respond? Just only a, a, few. a few seconds. Thank you very much, Your Holiness, for this detailed answer. Uh, I would like to point out that, uh, you know, Buddhism and, and the Western civilization as a whole have taken completely opposite path at the beginning because one was going towards inwards inquiry, the other one was going towards trying to, to understand nature of reality by external inquiry. And yet, when you go, the, the lesson of the West is that when you go at the far end of this uh, external inquiry, such as in modern physics, you, you hit the limits of objectivity. And therefore, you are forced to recognize something different and uh, connect, for instance, to the wisdom of Buddhism. And I must say, it's exactly my personal story, because I was a student of quantum mechanics. I went to, to, to understand that when I had the feeling that I had understood the views of uh, Niels Bohr, Schrodinger, and all these people, I, I was, un, I had unease because it didn't fit with my prejudice, uh, my classical views of the world. I wanted to discover the nature of reality as an object. For me, reality was an object, not, uh, not something more in, involved than that. And when I realized that it was not possible, I, I felt a little bit strange. And then I discovered Buddhism. And I said, that's it, that fits. <laughs> thank, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, thank you Your Holiness.
so um, in Professor Pillar Ratna's presentation, there was the important emphasis placed on understanding dependent origination, dependent arising. Um, in, in the Sanskrit tradition, uh, one makes distinction between different levels of understanding of this concept. One is dependent origination in terms of causes and effects, so causal uh, dependence. The other one is dependent, yeah, uh, and that is common to all the Buddhist schools. And then dependent origination is also understood in terms of dependence between parts and whole, which is a bit more sophisticated kind of concept. It's not just causal dependence and temporal dependence, but it's more of a, a idea of an ident identity of a, of, a, of a phenomena. And then in the Madhyamaka uh, school in particular, <coughs> uh, again, uh, another level of yeah, uh, those schools uh, that do not accept any notion of objective reality, even on a conventional level, um, they uh, understand dependent origination in terms of dependent designation. The, the, the fact that you know the identity is a construct of dependent labels and so on. So three levels. Three levels. So meaning, it's pratidha samupadya. Yeah. 